Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us for the March Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup. I think we have a, a great uh, agenda today. And just to, to let everyone know, uh, we are recording this call. Um, and, and also at the beginning of these things, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Industry Group and Hyperledger for their ongoing support in making this group possible. Our speaker today is Daniel Zegu. He's a DLT architect, and he's going to be discussing tokenization. So let's go ahead and get started. OK. Uh OK. Um, uh, before we get started, Daniel, I, there are a couple things that we want to go through in, in terms of the agenda. Um, we always like to review the antitrust policy. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and it's under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussion of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect, never discriminate, communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. And for new participants, we welcome you. And if you'd like, please introduce yourself in the chat and let us know if there's any specific areas of interest or, or just say hi. Okay, uh, the next slide, here's our agenda for today. We've just gone over the general introduction and welcome, antitrust code of conduct, We'll have a couple of minutes on Hyperledger community information. James is going to provide the update for the blockchain in the mortgage industry. And then Daniel will cover the tokenization of financial services. And we'll have a Q&A at the end. If you do have questions during the course of this presentation, by all means, uh, raise your question or type it in the chat. Okay. We always cover the slide in each of our meetings, and this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey, but we may be at different points along that path. This group is meant to help everyone on that journey and to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases or financial services use cases and define the potential path for the mortgage industry. What does a mortgage company need to implement blockchain? How difficult is it? And how we can all help each other along that path. Okay, so our community information, we always cover the, the next three slides really briefly. Um, and this is primarily for people that are new to the group. This slides provides link to different, different Hyperledger resources. The second from the bottom one uh, provides the link to the mortgage industry subgroup wiki. So I invite you to take a look at that. These are great resources and we'll reference several of them during the course of our presentation. Okay, how do you access these resources? You need an LFID. This slide will walk you through that. I'm not gonna go through it, but this is how you access those resources. And then the last one, Hyperledger offers free blockchain training this is how I got up to speed on blockchain and Hyperledger. Highly encourage it. It's free. So please avail yourself of this. And with that, that brings us to James's update for the mortgage industry. James, take it away. Marvin, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the first slide. So, you know, and sticking with the theme with Daniel being here, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing going on relevant to tokenization. Um, so, you know, as we're looking at the real estate industry, um, so real estate tokenization can convert real estate into a token stored on the blockchain. These divisible tokens represent a fractional share of ownership in the real estate, and they provide several advantages from lower barrier to entry, allowing lower minimums and smaller investment amounts compared, compared to your traditional real estate investments, uh, ability to create liquidity. Liquidity. So real estate tokens are easily and securely transferable by way of the blockchain, allowing investors to diversify um, their portfolios and help minimize their risk. 
there's lower transaction costs and post management and security. You know, traditionally, when a real estate asset is sold, there's a heavy process of transferring documentation that must occur. And through blockchain, as we all know, that can heavily eliminate it. Uh, you know, great article from Blockworks. It was actually posted via LinkedIn. Um, I'll talk about the wiki when we get a couple slides in, and you'll be able to access all of these articles from the wiki. The wiki. Over in uh, JP Morgan world, so JP Morgan's recently proposed a new concept called a deposit token. Deposit tokens are transferable tokens issued by a licensed institution on a blockchain as evidence of a deposit claim against the insurer. So given that deposit tokens are commercial bank money embodied in a new technical form, they sit comfortably as part of the banking ecosystem, subject to regulation and supervision applicable to commercial banks. This includes existing bank minimum capacity and liquidity requirements and other technology risk man management regulations and supervisory expectations. The bank argues that deposit tokens are much safer than stable coins as they don't pose systemic uh, risks to the financial system. And JP Morgan has claimed that deposit tokens may have, may enable advanced programmabil programmability features, the ability to exchange funds with other di digital assets and the transfer of commercial bank money on ledgers that enjoy transparency and immutability that you have within a blockchain. Taking a look over in Europe, there's a German bank, Deca Bank, that's collaborating with Medico, which is a digital asset management company. It plans to launch a new blockchain platform in 2024. The partnership will launch Harmonize, the core blockchain-based platform providing institutional digital assets. According to, according to Andrea Sack, who's the digital asset custody executive at Deca Bank, the new infrastructure is focusing on the tokenization of bonds, stocks, and other funds that will open up a new token economy. Additionally, DecaBank has decided not to trade crypto assets in collaboration with Medico. The bank's interested only in regulated products under the German Electronic Securities Act regulation. So we're starting to see a theme here, particularly from these last two articles, that banks around the world are seeing the benefits of blockchain, but they're looking for alternative solutions to crypto that'll work within the existing financial ecosystems that are currently available. Um, Marvin, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So yeah, I wanted to bring up um, CB Insights has issued their annual state of blockchain report for 2022. You know, as you'll recall throughout last year, we would pull highlights out of their quarterly reports. Um, and we do have the 2021 uh, CB Insights report available on the wiki as well. Um, so you can do a comparison. But, you know, to glean over a few of the highlights from this report, so $26.8 in global blockchain funding last year. Um, most of those deals hit during the first quarter, very strong first quarter. But then as the crypto market had its impacts, we went into what they called the crypto winner, causing three straight quarters of declines as investors repeatedly scaled back um, due to macroeconomic pressures, stablecoin collapse, multiple crypto bankruptcies, and ultimately the fall of uh, FTX that we talked about last month. 50% um, of that funding is in U.S.-based companies. U.S. has been leading the uh, blockchain funding year over year, though the fourth quarter of last year, both Europe and Asia matched the U.S. in blockchain funding. That's definitely appearing to be a trend, um, and it's kind of anticipated in 2024, both Europe and Asia may overtake the U.S. in the funding that's available. You know, taking a look at some of the downsides for last year, a 48% drop in funding to crypto exchanges and wallets. Um, venture funding, as we mentioned, dropped dramatically during the last three quarters. Um, also a 23% drop in funding in institutional uh, crypto and custody, though it's noted that influential players like BlackRock and uh, BNY Mellon, they remain bullish on institutional interest in crypto. 
crypto. However, the tokenization of securities, not crypto, is an emerging area to keep an eye on. We've also seen an 81% growth last year in funding in both infrastructure and development within the uh, blockchain world. So it's a great report they produce every year. It's roughly about 160 pages uh, full of graphs and information. They break down the report by global trends. They spotlight Web3, NFTs, DeFi, the metaverse, as well as giving a uh, geographical breakdown by US. Europe and Asia. Uh, Marvin, the next slide. So just a reminder, here is our wiki site. We'll uh, drop into the chat um, a link convenient for everybody to click on and get access to. Um, over on the left-hand side, if you're looking for any of our past presentations over the last year and a half, you'll actually see those listed on the left-hand side. You can see both the recordings as well as the presentations that we did. All of the articles that we discussed today, you'll see those over on the right-hand side. If you're looking for that CB Insights report, scroll down on the far right-hand side and under um, the global mortgage industry research, uh, we have another uh, research section that the CB Insights report is on. But do take a look. Um, Marvin shared the information on how to set up your LFID. It's also in the upper right-hand corner, right under resources, the directions for that. But if you do go ahead and sign up at the wiki, whenever we're posting articles there, making updates or posting copies of these monthly presentations, you will receive automatic notification of those. Uh, Marvin, next slide. I think we're up to Daniel now. Fantastic. I'll pass it back over to you guys. Thanks, James. Uh, great information. Yeah, that's a real interesting uh, CV Insights report. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Daniel Zago. He's a DLT architect. Daniel has been working in different distributed ledger technologies for five plus years, including but not limited to Hyperledger Fabric, Indy, Ethereum, and Polygon. He's made multiple presentations on blockchain topics, including atomic cross-chain swap between Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum, Hyperledger Fabric and Consortium Blockchain Challenges, cross-border CBDC tokenization and DLT, and a deep dive into key certificates and access control of Hyperledger Fabric. So Daniel, it's an honor to have you here today and take it away. I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, let me just give a shot and then uh, share my screen. Uh, you cannot sh uh, Okay, just a second. Awesome. Uh, so theoretically, you should see my screen. Uh, I just turn my yep. camera off. Uh, it's going to be better. Uh, so hi everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good and good evening everybody. Uh, this is Daniel and the today uh, today's brief presentation is gonna be on on tokenization and and, and especially uh, having use cases as, as tokenized uh, financial securities. Uh, I would say uh, it's gonna be just an introduction, so we can't go very much deep into the details. Uh, but perhaps in a subsequent presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like just to apologize. My network is a little bit buggy sometimes. So it might happen that I will I will just have like a 20 second unintended break. Uh, so if you see that that you know, I mean that's that's practically time for a for a coffee. I mean, supposing you have you have the coffee actually on, on board. So let me just start uh, with the presentation. Uh, so again, that's gonna be like an introduction to tokenized financial services. And let me just start from blockchain. So I'm 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 more like a technical actually guy. Uh, I have some financial background as well, but I have more more experience with technology. So I would just start from blockchain. And if you just take a look on blockchain evolution, I mean everything started with Bitcoin. The next step is something which is public smart or public or consortium smart contract system. Uh, started with Ethereum, uh, but practically uh, what. What's more important uh, is that this kind of innovation splits from public smart contract systems. 
and we have like two directions, uh, two way of innovation. One is the so-called infrastructure innovation, uh, which is like layer one scaling, layer two scaling, or cross chain uh, cross chain swaps or cross chain cooperation. Uh, this kind of infrastructure stuff is is kind of very very technical. You know, it just uh, makes you know blockchain faster, better, uh, more private, and so on and so on. But what's an interesting direction is the other direction, and I would say that's kind of an application level innovation, and it starts with tokens. So basically, application level innovation goes a little bit into the direction that this kind of application or abstract tokens or abstract things can be actually interpreted uh, independently from the underlying infrastructure. If you take a look, for instance, even Visa started something with tokenization, which is not a blockchain at all. So consider in the, this application level innovation, I mean, the, the major direction that, that we saw practically in the last uh, two years, one is like NFT, uh, that was a big hype. Another one is DeFi. It was again, a little bit hype. And yeah, I would say the bubble is a little bit exploded at the moment. And perhaps the third direction, which is coming is kind of classical financial securities that are tokenized on different blockchains, or I would say on different infrastructure. So this is like a blockchain evolution. So let me just continue. What is the token basically? Uh, so a token is, is I would say it's like a poker chip uh, that there's no exact definition what's token uh, as far as I know. So I would just give like an intuition definition, intuitive definition. That's like a poker chip, which moves on the blockchain basically. Uh, so you get a poker, an abstract uh, or virtual poker chip. Uh, you can imagine there can be like many different chips, uh, poker chips. They can be different based on size, color, amount. Perhaps even the shape can be different. And what's important, this abstract entity is interpreted only on the blockchain for the first round. And what blockchain does, uh, it gives you practically a kind of an abstract ownership or a quasi ownership. I would say it's quasi because that's not a physical ownership. That's a so-called cryptographic ownership. So practically, it means if you get the private keys and you can make a signature with these keys, then do you do you you own this token? But it's important to note this is not a legal ownership for the first round. This is a kind of cryptographic ownership. And then if you own this token in a cryptographic sense, then you can transfer these tokens. If you if you get like multi-token systems, so let's just, just imagine we get we get a yellow uh, yellow chip, a yellow poker chip, and and the green one. And we can we can just transfer them, but we can exchange them somehow somehow. And all of these functionalities, all of these uh, exchanges or transferring stuffs are defined on the blockchain practically, uh, as the whole token is defined on the blockchain as well. Uh, the implementation itself is is usually something something to do with smart contracts. Uh, there are native tokens as well, but I would say this is like a little bit like uh, it's getting it's getting technically deep. So I just don't don't follow this direction. Uh, this is just one slide. You probably know actually these these basic token types. Uh, so these are the basic token types. You get like fungible tokens. Uh, in fungible tokens, uh, one token is is absolutely identical uh, or or practically the same same as another one. So if you just imagine the idea, if you if you want to tokenize like money, then one one dollar is is the same as another dollar practically. You can use it in the same way. So practically they are the same. If you just like to tokenize like natural resources, one one gallon or one liter of water should be actually the same as another one. So they are practically the same. Uh, examples are, are currency or cryptocurrency or or stuff like that. These are the fungible tokens, and exactly the opposite is the is the so-called NFTs. These are the non-fungible tokens. In, in non-fungible tokens, one token is totally different from another one. So I mean, just take an example. We want to tokenize like art fine art like you want to mona, uh, to tokenize mona lisa and picasso and then if you just imagine that that mona lisa is represented by a token and picasso is represented by another token then these tokens are are different so so mona lisa is absolutely different from from picasso and the tokens representing these arts are different as well so these are the nft tokens uh perhaps it's important to point out that that these are the the token categories that are the main theme and we know. So uh, there are many other, um, they are less less known. So like hybrid tokens, like kind of something which is which is fun in between fungible and 
non-fungible tokens. So if you want to do like fractional ownership for, for Picasso, for instance, it is possible that's gonna be like kind of a hybrid token. And then it's important to point out, I mean, this field is under innovation as well. So the fact that we have these token types doesn't mean doesn't mean that it it's it's not gonna be uh, developed further or innovated further. Perhaps in five years we're gonna have like I don't know five, ten, hundred uh, new token types as well. But again, uh, so these are the basic types. So like fungible and non-fungible tokens. So if we speak of tokenization, uh, I I usually I usually find it uh, practical to point out that I mean the whole context of tokenization, and then so so we can imagine uh, that. Let me just speak of ownership. Uh, let me just speak of that. I own, for instance, a mobile phone uh, or something. And then in terms of ownership, um, we can define like three categories. And I think it's important to understand these three representations of an asset because then we, we can understand and better grab most of the discussion uh, that's happening on the world uh, in terms of uh, legal Hey, Daniel, I, I think we just lost your audio. Okay, I'm going to send him a quick chat. So I had my break now, uh, but that was like a coffee break because this okay. is a yeah, this is a hard topic anyway. So, so I think it's important to understand or, or see this deep, three different kind of asset representation. And one is basically physical. So if I have like a mobile phone, I have it in my hands. So basically I physically have this, this mobile phone. I can give it to somebody. So it's like kind of a physical transfer of that asset, of that object. Uh, we can speak of something which is kind of a legal or institutional ownership. So, so for instance, uh, there's there's a legal system uh, which defines, for instance, that I'm I'm the owner of a, of a real estate, for instance, or of a car, for instance, uh, independently if I if I physically has it, ha have it or not. And basically, uh, in this world, the legal system defines something which is ownership, and the legal system defines something which is which is a transfer of that ownership. And then basically it's important to note, and I mean, this physical ownership and legal or institutional ownership, they are not the same, uh, but it has like, you know, having the connection between these, between these two words is like having like 2000 years history. So what happens if I live in my real estate, but it's not mine from a legal point of view and it is transferred legally, but it's not physically. Um, so for, for, kind of a disputes basically i mean there's a whole legal system uh, which makes some which makes some resolutions for uh, between these two words but the point is that we get something new here and i would say that's the third category at the moment and that's that's tokenization um so if we speak of basically blockchain and token we get again a poker chip on the blockchain which is defined uh, as an ownership from a cryptographic point of view, if I have the keys and if I can sign signatures, basically with that, I, I own that token from a cryptographic point of view. So most of the discussion and most of the problems uh, with blockchain, I think is somehow combining these three words. Uh, and it is especially true if we speak of like, like financial ins instruments, um, if you speak of financial instruments, uh, I would say these are like mostly kind of kind of legal or, or in institutional constructs. So physical uh, physical institutes uh, or physical instruments are are not necessarily physical, although although there can be some some physical characteristics as well. But uh, tokenizing in the financial world basically usually means a kind of somehow combining this classical legal and the institutional thinking with the blockchain tokenized thinking uh, and then and then there are many variations and, and many solutions how this can be this can be done 
um, usually I would say there are there are two big directions. And the one big direction is starting from the blockchain world, from the from the cryptographic ownership. Um, and the point is uh, there are a lot of crypto assets uh, like like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, like Ether, which are basically native crypto assets. So they didn't exist uh, previously. And then the question is how this kind of native token, this born on blockchain tokens can be somehow put into the classical uh, or institutional world, how they can be handled, for instance, in a fully legal world. Uh, so, for instance, is Bitcoin a security or, or it's not a security? Well, what happens if Ether in Ethereum, is it a security? Is it a financial security or is it not a security? What happens if I go to DeFi, for instance, and I just combine two, two assets? So I, I put like an on-chain fund uh, having both Ether and Bitcoin and then just retokenize it. Is it something which is which is legally a financial in, uh, instrument, or is it is it something different? So these are the hard questions, and this is one way basically. This is like the crypto and token regulation, and there are many initiatives. Actually, uh, there are initiative for for security tokens. Uh, there's the there's the Mika regulation in in the EU. That's the uh, I mean, that's the coming micro, micro regulation, that's marketing crypto assets regulation in the EU. Then there's like separate regulation in Luxembourg. And then I'm, I'm sure there are like regulation attempts uh, 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 over all the world. But what we are talking about uh, in this presentation is rather the, the other direction. And let me just have kind of financial, classical financial instruments, which are which are well known, uh, which are well well established, you know, I mean, legal frameworks, uh, like for instance, classical classical money, for instance, uh, that we have like like the 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 the, the euro, for instance, as a classical money, uh, which already exists even in physical form, or let we have like like corporate bonds or stocks, and let we just try to put them to the blockchain in a tokenized form. So if we speak of like tokenized securities, then this is the this is the way, this is the direction that we are that we are considering. And I would say it is sometimes easier from a from a legal po point of view. It has some other challenges, uh, I would say. So um, there are some hints basically how you can bind, for instance, uh, a token uh, with with kind of with kind of a legal uh, legal something. Uh, so, so I'm not a lawyer, so so I, I can't say much on the on the on the legal side. But technically, what you usually can do, you can have, for instance, a classical contract uh, under your, or you can bind, for instance, a classical written contract uh, with your token. Uh, there are like it's it's a classical digitized written contract, which is not a smart contract, but a contract for a certain legislation. And you can just uh, upload it to a decentralized storage and you just bind it with your token, for instance, with hash or something similar. There are even systems that, that are capable of doing it uh, out of box. It's like the, the R3 quarter is, is, for instance, um, such a system. So this is one you know, technical way of combining this, these two words. Certainly, there are other uh, challenges as well. So like, for instance, classical blockchains or especially public blockchains use something which is a pseudonymization. Uh, it's not very it's not the best idea in a classical legal system you know I mean, it's it's difficult i mean i mean the whole legal or institutional institutional system or, or 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 financial system based on identity so it's combining something with the pseudonymization is sometimes hard uh then usually there are like technical challenges it's like so if you sign basically with your with your private key uh, then, then you can transfer your token on the blockchain, but this signature is is not necessarily a legally binding digital signature. Uh, but it's again, it's just kind of a technical uh, technical uh, problem or challenges. And let me just uh, let us just see a couple of big areas uh, where this that is where this tokenized security world is is heavily evolving or or, or heavily uh, heavily improving. Um, one. I would consider money as as tokenized security. Uh, it's just in a little bit broader sense, perhaps. Uh, but one big direction is is CBDC. Uh, that's like central bank digital uh, digital currency, and it's I mean it's I mean the yeah so 
So the core idea is very simple. Uh, let we put classical money like like the like the euro in the EU and and let we just have it in a tokenized form. And there's heavy discussion uh, how this tokenized form would would work. But basically, I mean, from a categorization point of view, there can be like two big areas where we can consider such a CBDC. It's again kind of tokenized money or tokenized payment. And if I say money or payment, uh, this is like like money of a central bank, uh, like like money or officially issued uh, money um, of a central bank or, or or officially official liability of a central bank, like the like the European Central Bank. So that's what I mean by CBDC. It's it's not a stable coin, uh, and especially not a not a cryptocurrency. But from a technological point of view, are uh, pretty similar. So we got a couple of CBDC use cases. I mean the. And, and it's still heavily discussed where exactly CBDC can be used. Uh, the idea is, is using like retail in retail CBDC. So so practically in in every every shopping, uh, if I just you know, I mean I mean buy buy a, buy a piece of bread for instance in the supermarket, then I can pay by CBDC. That's the that's the retail CBDC direction. Uh, another direction is the wholesale CBDC. That's like interbanking money. Uh, What's probably even more interesting is kind of cross-border uh, CBDC or cross-border uh, CBDC use cases. And even in cross-border, we can we can just uh, differentiate two areas. One area is, is kind of cross-border retail, and the other one is like cross-border wholesale CBDC. Uh, these are like, I mean, I mean, practically international interbanking money transfers. Uh, and it's especially it's a hard field, but I think it's especially challenging because so let me put it that way, they have the you know, I mean the need for optimization and making it cheaper and faster and stuff like that. But these are the classical use cases. Uh, we got some innovative use cases as like as as well. Uh, they, they are they are still very uh, very in early phase and pretty much in brainstorming. So uh, there's like the question if we can use CBDC in Web3 or if we can use CBDC in DeFi uh, or especially if, I mean, the question is uh, supposing that there's going to be metaverse and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be metaverse like in 10 years, perhaps not, not in two years as everybody promised, but I'm sure there's going to be like metaverse. So metaverse is not just like, for instance, a virtual reality, but it it focus it has very strongly meant to have a very strong tokenization uh, behind metaverse, and as, of course the question is, what's gonna be the payment in metaverse? Uh, I mean one idea is is CBDC, uh, which might provide kind of a you know I mean more regulated aspect to the whole field. Uh, of course, the other direction is just having like stable coins or crypto cryptocurrency. But basically, I mean, nobody likes that idea uh, in the in the regulated world. And there are even initiatives. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, in Singapore, for instance, uh, to have something which is which is more like a synthetic CBDC. In synthetic CBDC, is is kind of a stable coin, uh, which is practically issued indirectly by a central bank. Uh, so it would practically use, I mean, these use cases supposed to have like uh, their own infra infrastructure. So something which is which is either either consortium blockchain or perhaps perhaps even without blockchain, like with a classical message-based system. Um, synthetic CBDC is something which is meant to use like public blockchain platforms and work in a similar way as uh, stable cryptocurrencies at the moment. Uh, the only the only thing is that they can be somehow um, issued, perhaps not directly by central banks, but indirectly by uh, by central banks. Um, so that's like synthetic CBDC. And from the technological point of view, it's perhaps um, Daniel. If I could interrupt you, I might just put a question in the chat: Is Swift moving to blockchain, or is there a sure. private blockchain alternative? I don't think Swift is, move, Swift is moving to the to the to the blockchain blockchain di direction. I mean, I mean, I mean. So so that's like. Uh, uh, let me just have the the other uh, the other part of my slide, uh, okay. and and I will just try to answer the question as as far as I can. So from a technological point of view, it's it's not a must uh, that CBDCs is, is implemented on blockchain. 
it's it's not true at all. Um, so for instance, the the latest directions from the European Central Bank is going going rather to a message based system probably, uh, and not to blockchain. I mean, blockchain having like many issues at the moment it's, it's especially scalability and so on it's just you know i mean i deal mostly with blockchain so i just follow actually more like the uh, more like the initiatives uh, that are on blockchain but there are many many considerations of having cbdc on on classical message based systems that's like swift that's like that's like visa uh that's like uh, iso uh, 20000 2020 20 direction these are the classical message based systems and then as far as i know swift is not not moving to blockchain they they might have some some blockchain initiatives um if they have something i would say it's like kind of a, a kind of an interoper interoperability initiative so like like having something with with swift core platform and and somehow exchanging data or token or asset uh, with a blockchain platform. I think that that would be the direction. But Swift, Swift is 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 classical message-based platform. So the core, core platform is, is surely not a blockchain platform. Again, I mean they might have some some blockchain initiatives, but hey guys, I think this is our coffee break. Change everything. Uh you know, to blockchain in a in a shorter uh, shorter term. So this is like the technology. Uh, so and then, I mean, if it's not a message base, we got some some ideas uh, how CBDC can be done. Um, it's usually, of course, I mean, one direction is like like on general distributed ledger platforms. Uh, one direction is having like consortium blockchains. Uh, and then there are even initiatives uh, doing something on public blockchains. So usually, I mean, the idea is having something on consortium ledgers uh, because because it's like it's like CBDC. It's it's like you know banking money. So, so they don't like tokens putting to the to the wild internet. Uh, the only problem is that yes, yeah, so like consortium blockchains are sometimes not so easy. You know, it's just not so easy to set up a platform. Uh, and then sometimes public blockchain technology evolves faster uh, from a technological point of view. And I must say, I mean, there are even initiatives to start something on public blockchains. So as far as I know, for instance, uh, there are at least two uh, like cross-border initiatives uh, between, that was the um, French French Central Bank, uh, Banque de France and the, and the Swiss National Bank, I think it's a Schweizer National Bank. So they they have they have like some initiatives for cross border payment, and I think partly they they involve like like public Ethereum uh, networks. Uh, again, it's not so typical, but 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 there are ideas, and especially if I just go back like like for synthetic CBDC, uh, I mean the idea is for instance using something similar as a stable coin on a public blockchain. Um, it is just, just issued by, not by anybody from the wild, uh, but by by regulated institutes or or even directly from, from central banks. So this is the use case, and this is the technological roadmap for CBDC. Uh, but I mean, there are many other directions and, and other interesting ideas as well. So um, as, as, as James, James mentioned as well, um, I got I got this one on my slide as well. It's like CBDC central bank bank money, but like tokenized commercial bank bank money, and it's I would say it's kind of a logical step because you know, I mean I would say central banks sometimes move pretty slow, um, which is certainly not a bad thing from a stability point of view, but especially in terms of innovation, perhaps not the best. Uh, but you know I mean. Practically, banks issue their private money, money in a normal sense, which is, you know, I mean, connected somehow to central bank money, uh, money uh, with a par. So, I mean, I mean, it's a logical idea that commercial banks uh, can create their their own tokenized money as well. And there's even a framework for uh, for that, and and the good white paper from from JP Morgan. So the idea is pr uh, practically kind of a tokenized tokenized deposit accounts um which are the which are the deposit tokens basically uh 
So it's a very very interesting and novel and novel way of 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 doing doing something. I'm not quite sure about the technological basis. I think they they promote like kind of a consortium network, if I'm not mistaken, but I I don't exactly know the details. And of course, I mean there are ideas to like having uh, classical financial securities and putting them to the blockchain. Um, so one example is like tokenized uh, bond issu issuance. Uh, and it's like a two weeks uh, article, I think. So, for instance, Siemens, uh, which is, I mean, I mean, isn't necessarily considered the most innovative uh, company on the world, issued digital bond. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure on, on which on which blockchain, but it was surely a tokenized bond. And it's uh, it was an initiative. Uh, they said, uh, I mean, they issued practically the token, uh, so you can hold the token. Uh, which represents a bond, of course. I mean, the legal uh, con constraint. There's there's a company guarantee for for sure from from Siemens. So if you have the if you have the bond, then the if you have the token, then the company practically guarantees for you that that's a bond. Uh, and as far as I know, it was a hybrid solution or a hybrid uh, digitized bond issuance. There's there's no payment. So, so there's there's still no digital euro. Uh, so for this reason, uh, payment uh, was done practically in the classical uh, banking system with with fiat money. Uh, but the bond itself uh, is represented on the blockchain. And I think I think uh, they they said as a result that even if that's a hybrid system and we don't get payment uh, practically on chain, just just on 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 classical uh, banking infrastructure. I mean I mean. Having just the bonds on 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 blockchain um, has like a much faster, much better, uh, much flexible system uh, than than they used to be. Uh, then there are some other examples that I just listed here. Um, there's something which is green bond. Uh, I would say it's like a, a different category. It's like uh, BMP Paribas, if I can pronounce it correctly. Uh, they 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 issued like green bonds um, tokenized on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, I would say, I mean, green bond is is especially an interesting topic because it is very innovative. And if it's if it's a green bond, uh, it is usually connected somehow with like like you know like carbon carbon emission or or some some environment friendliness or sustainability. And what you can do if you tokenize green bonds on the blockchain. You can you can somehow or you can technically prove that this is really a green bond. So it's not just like greenwashing, but you know, I mean, I mean, there are initiatives even at Hyperledger like putting carbon emission to the blockchain. So if you just if you have like carbon emission or methane emission information on chain, and if you if you provide tokens which are which represent green bond as well on chain, then you can practically combine the two. So you can you can make kind of a you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, less trust lead and most more more flexible uh, system where, where practically everybody has a has a better view that if that if that bond is set to be green, it is it is really green in some sense. So like you can just cover the the emission data behind, for instance, uh, which is on chain as well. And last but not least, there are initiatives for for tokenized talk issuance. So it's it's classical tokenized stock. I mean, I just have like two examples here. So like Sig Signum Bank, it's I think it's, it's Switzerland. Uh, they do like uh, classical uh, IPOs, but they had like a parallel listing uh, practically uh, stocks uh, or company shares in the Singapore Digital Exchange as well. Uh, and then one example, uh, it's like I think it's at least six months old. It's like Quadrat Bioscience, which which tokenized like company shares, for instance, on 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 blockchain as well. Uh, if it's about uh, stock, I would say there's one more interesting property uh, that can be combined, and it looks that way. So I would say, uh, so if this token kind of a company share. Then, then for company share, you get like two things, uh, which is I would consider more like physical uh, properties. Uh, one is voting. I mean, you can vote for a company if you have a share, and the other one uh, getting getting paid practically at, at the end of the year if if there's if there's like profit. And I would say, I mean, I mean, both of the features can be somehow 
technically combined with your token. So if you have a token and if you have like a digital voting system, then then practically you can digitize this voting uh, for a for a company stock, uh, a company share, which is which is a token itself. And if if at the end of the year there's revenue, then even the payment can be actually done uh, somehow uh, on a more on a more trans transparent way on the blockchain. So that was basically the introduction. Uh, I think it wasn't so short, you know. But uh, so this is a big field, I would say. Uh, and I would just go back to the to my first slide. So we are speaking about this direction here, which is kind of a tokenized financial securities, which is an evolving field. And I would say, uh, so it, it can be really big, like in the next uh, five years. So that was my presentation. Uh, let me just check the questions, if I can answer them at all. Mm. So there's there's no really questions, just Swift, uh, but Again, so I don't think Swift is moving uh, to, a, to a private blockchain alternative. I, I saw some initiatives from Swift, but I think uh, it's kind of an interoperability between the Swiss, Swift core system and with, with kind of a blockchain. Uh, but but who knows? Yeah. And, and Daniel, um, if I could interject, uh, Mike, uh, as uh, further answering your question, we've included in the chat uh, an article um, that talked about Swift. They're doing a proof of concept on blockchain. So we put that article in the chat if you want to take a look at it. So I, I think to what Daniel's saying, um, they haven't made a, a, any great steps toward it, but they're taking a look at it. So um, it'd be interesting to see. N now, Daniel, you talked uh, about quite a few things. Uh, thank you. That, that was a great presentation. Uh, one question that pops into my mind, especially as we take a look at the mortgage industry, in there is some tokenization, tokenization that's taking place already, but a lot of these efforts are on different blockchain platforms. So if tokenization is taking place within Bitcoin, within Ethereum, within, I, I think uh, Redwood Trust was using Stellar, what are the implications around interoperability? If I'm on one blockchain platform, how do I get a token from another blockchain platform? Can you kind of tell us how that works? Sure. Uh, so, so technically, blockchain interoperability is is solvable. Uh, so, so you can you can do it. You can do it if you want. It's like it's like a pretty much evolving field. So there are there are yeah. So I would say um, it probably needs like five year research and development, but already you can do like uh, cross chain swaps. Um, cross chain swap is a way that you that one transaction on one blockchain can be done if and only if, if another transaction can be done on another blockchain. So it's like exchanging for for Bitcoin to Ethereum. Uh, the you can get I mean you can get the, the Ether on Ethereum. If I get the Bitcoin, for instance, yep. and then there's a guarantee that the two two transactions are done uh, in the same time. The other one that is mentioned here is like cross chain bridges. In cross chain bridge, what you do basically, you look, you practically map one token to another uh, to another uh, to another chain. So what you do basically, you lock your token on one chain and you issue kind of a wrap token on another one. And then if you just burn that wrap token then you release your original token on, on the on the first blockchain. And there's there's usually kind of a bridge which guarantees this consistency. So I would say, so that's that's the two things. There's a free way as uh, third, third way as well. Uh, it's it's always a question if you do like a cross-chain cross -chain interoperability, if you need to avoid like cross-chain double spending. In these two two examples, like cross-chain uh, cross bridges, uh, Cross chain swaps uh, and and stuffs. Uh, you need to avoid basically um, cross chain double spending. But usually that's not the case, uh, or sometimes it's not the case. You just get a piece of information that you want to mirror everywhere. Uh, then you don't need to worry about like like cross chain double spending. Then then you can do basically with an with an oracle. Uh, that's the third direction. And there's like ongoing uh, research. If you want to do like 
cross-chain interoperability in a way that you you want to somehow to to execute a business logic in the middle of your swap or of, of your chain in a trustless way. And it's pretty much, uh, I would say, in in research and development. But the the modern modern zero knowledge systems are gonna solve or might provide solutions for 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 such problems as well. Uh, and uh, someone mentioned in, in the chat, I think it was Mike as well, about the uh, security concerns around that, which I've heard about as well. But then the other concern that um, I, I've heard about and, and I share is the energy consumption for that type of step. In already with the proof of work consensus mechanisms within blockchain, Ethereum has now gone to proof of stake. In If you try to have that type of interoperability, it's just... Uh, for energy consumption, that's going to be pretty significant, or at least increase, and then transaction processing speed. Yeah, so uh, so energy consumption comes from the consensus algorithm, yeah. and then so if you get like two two blockchains and one working with proof of work, then then energy consumption is is an issue. Hey, Daniel, this is a great presentation. We appreciate you coming today. Um, you know, I, I wanted to reflect back work as well, on... but, oh. but usually that's not, not the case. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me just somehow try to do it uh, one by one. So, so I don't think that the, that the, you know, I mean, cross-chain interoperability will have like bigger, like, energy consumption than than the individual chains and then the point is or then the question is uh yeah so like what's gonna happen with bitcoin uh which consumes a lot of energy of course and then they don't don't plan to you know i mean i mean upgrade to like a proof of stake uh so then then that's the question that that practically remains i would say uh yeah so there's there's a question actually uh like the privacy concerns and around retail, retail CBDC, and that's that's indeed actually a big question. Uh, and I would say um so this this point is like a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's it's more complicated because there's like two at least two aspects. One is a technological aspect, and the second one is is more like a you know I mean I mean political and 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 society aspect of this question. So from a technological point of view, you can you can do on a blockchain uh, practically tokens uh, with the same same privacy guarantee guarantee as cash. Uh, that's like that's like Zcash. That's like Dash. Uh, these are privacy coins. Uh, they have they have practically the same privacy guarantee as as cash. Uh, especially with like with like the zero knowledge movement at the moment. Perhaps in a couple of years, even on Ethereum, you, you can do like private transactions as well. They they gonna have like almost the same uh, privacy guarantee as as cash, uh, for instance. Uh, so this this is the technological point of view. Uh, from the from the political and soci society point of view, especially, I mean, the question if if you know if uh, if a central bank uh, wants to to issue like fully private money, uh, and that's like a more complicated question, and and I and I I just just wouldn't go very much deep into this question because this is like a really big discussion. So usually, like you know, I mean, most central banks don't plan to issue um, so private money than 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 their short Zcash, for instance. Uh, there's there must be a certain level of privacy. But somehow, like you know, I mean the the uh, the the KYC and uh, and a lot of regulations which are not exactly you know, privacy friendly should be somehow kept. Uh, so this is one one I mean side of the coin. The other side of the coin, uh, which is the privacy level, uh, which is which is accepted by the society. So it it might happen then you know I mean perhaps central banks just monitor each and every transaction. Um, certainly, it's not necessary. Kind of a CBDC design, uh, which is which is accepted by the by the society. So if that happens, practically nobody will use that system. 
So again, uh, from the so I can answer more the technological point of view again, huh? and all the other aspects are uh, just just more controversial. But from the technological point of view, you can you can do it practically as private as you want. I mean, I mean already there are initiatives, and and there's gonna be much much more as zero knowledge zero knowledge proof uh, system proof systems uh, come come to life uh, to production. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, are there any other questions for Daniel on tokenization? As Daniel's been saying, and I think as we're all learning, this is a very broad topic with a lot of complexity. And we're just starting at the very beginning here. And I think, Daniel, you've done a great job of giving us a tokenization primer and uh, we'll continue in the future meetings to dive deeper and deeper into this. And we definitely appreciate you getting started and we'll probably want to have you back for future discussions as well. So let me just open it up to the team, to everyone else. Uh, any additional questions? Yeah, Daniel, I did have a quick question for you. So on slide seven in your presentation, you mentioned the challenges with consortium blockchains. Could you expand a little bit on that? We've been talking with this group over the last year, um, bringing very various articles to the table on different banking institutions that are forming these consortiums. And I, I'm interested from your perspective as to the challenges for that. Yeah. Uh, so the way I see, but that's my opinion, uh, so if you if you want to do something with consortium blockchains, uh, there are two yeah two challenges. One, you need to have the your your full infrastructure up and running. So it's not the same as you know if you if you're if you're a D app developer, uh, you can you can implement and develop and put something on a public chain in two days. If you want to you know I mean deliver practically infrastructure uh, for for five banks, that's that's gonna be a big project. I mean, I mean, I mean, just just imagine. I mean, if you if you just just want to de 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 uh, deliver any kind of uh, software for five banks, you get a lot of regulation. Uh, the infrastructure size is is not the easiest. If you speak of blockchain, it's not just five independent uh, node, for instance, or or component that you deliver for five banks, but these are five components that must basically uh, communicate with each other. Uh, so it might even be, you know, I mean, e even bigger challenge, for instance. Uh, you know, I mean, just, just giving one example, just, just imagine you get five banks, uh, each having like, like different ideas for, and processes for making a change, you know, modifying something in the system, but, but you can't implement five different change uh, change in your consortium blockchain. You got one consortium blockchain. There should be like one process, one way of making changes on the system. So, but as your five banks having like five totally different something, you're gonna have a lot of discussion uh, and and you need a lot of energy uh, making to a compromise. Uh, that's my experience basically. So that's one of one of, one of the big challenge. The second big challenge that I see. Um, so sometimes uh, crypto is evolving faster, and especially the infrastructure below crypto evolving faster as well. So, for instance, uh, like again, the newest way, uh, newest uh, wave of infrastructure innovation, gonna be like the the zero knowledge rollups. Uh, you can find them on on practically every second public blockchain. You you don't even find them on like. I mean, I, the, 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 as far as I know, there's there's no initiatives, for instance, for like Hyperledger Fabric or for RF Record. It's just, I mean, they are just behind a little bit. So this is the second challenge uh, that I see uh, in terms of like consortium blockchain. But again, so I would say the biggest biggest challenges. You know, again, if you have a public blockchain, you can have you can have an app, uh, a D app, practically or a token up and running in, in a couple of days, uh, that's not a problem. If you need to uh, install infrastructure to, to five banks, uh, that might be like a half year, one year process. Excellent, hey, thank hey. you. And Daniel, uh, we have time for one last question. Ramesh uh, put into the chat, is there any spec for CBDC implementation? 
So it's it's a good question. What, what you mean by spec are there's the uh, there's the open CBDC platform, which is uh, uh, which is which is open source. That's that's one one uh, one CBDC implementation. It's it's not just the spec, but it's it's an implementation as well with white paper and and stuff like that. It's it's like uh, partly from MIT, I think, and initiated by some banks in Boston, if I'm not mistaken. So, so you you can even find systems uh, which which is meant to be like like a, um, as a CBDC system. If you if you need like documentation, uh, so the last one I saw basically it's a it's a good summary on requirements on technical requi technical and non technical requirements for a CBDC. That's from that's from the Bank of England, uh, for instance. Uh, but basically, there are many reports. Uh, you can find almost on a on a monthly basis one one good report for for having one CBDC. Um, you know, I mean, direction and it's it's a little bit different as well. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, so so for which purpose do we want to use your CBDC? Because again, I mean, I mean, retail CBDC uh, has like totally different requirements than than a, than an OSL or a cross border OSL. I mean, in a retail CBDC, you need like I don't know couple of 10 to 100 to million transactions per second which is sometimes not even solvable uh, with blockchain in a in a in a whole series uh, you you might need like a uh, couple of 100 transactions per second uh, or even less which is which is to totally solvable uh, perhaps even by public blockchains as well it uh, thank you daniel and thanks james uh ramesh james put into the chat a link to the Open CBDC uh, white paper from uh, MIT, uh, and everyone. That brings us to the top of the hour. Uh, Daniel, again, thank you for joining us, and you clearly have a depth of knowledge in, in this, and we appreciate you uh, sharing your knowledge with us and, and answering these questions. It, it's been a, a great discussion, and we definitely like to bring you back for a future discussion because this is just the beginning uh, of. The tokenization discussion. Um, with that, thank you to everyone. We will post the recording to this call because usually we have uh, several hundred people asking or um, accessing the recordings to these calls at, at a later point. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good day, and we'll see you at our next uh, Hyperledger meeting. Have a great one, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Bye. Bye.